Right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Helen McLean. Um, I'm a, an archaeological consultant with AECOM, where I've worked for nearly 21 years uh, in various guises. Um, I mainly work on major infrastructure projects, um, particularly highways, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so over the past 20 years, the way in which we approach archaeological mitigation strategies on major infrastructure projects has changed. Um, while that's been incremental for the most part, we are beginning to see some more radical strategies beginning to emerge. Um, and we've got to start working differently to get better value from our projects and better public value for money as well. And the question is really, you know, are we getting the best results from doing what we've always done? Um, I'm going to use three major road screens from across my career um, and I'll discuss how the development of mitigation strategies has changed from a real dig everything approach to more recent strategies which have brought the question of value to the forefront with mitigation work targeted on key areas. So the first project I'm going to talk to you about was the A1 Darrington to Dishworth. Um, this was work that was undertaken in the early 2000s. Uh, it was a new offline motorway between Darrington in West Yorkshire heading up towards Weatherby in North Yorkshire. Um, there was very limited evaluation done on this scheme and a lot of that was done in the early 1990s as part of an earlier iteration of the scheme. And then there was a limited additional work done in early 2001, 2000, 2001, which was just before I actually joined the company. In terms of planning background, we were in a planning policy guide in 16 world, um, which while that had a requirement for evaluation, it was only where important <coughs> remains were identified by research. And there's no definition of important. There was, you know, what, what did you define as that? And there was nothing about examining blank areas. Uh, and while that information needed to be submitted as part of a, a planning application, um, you know, it was, it was very limited on what was actually required. And again, there was a huge emphasis on preservation in situ on these, whatever these important remains are actually considered to be. Because we knew we had a major site at Ferry Bridge, there was um, 12 months, uh, at least, I think, of, of advanced works which were undertaken in 2001 to 2002. So this was a significant and extensive prehistoric landscape. Um, there was a henge. You might be able to just see it on the right of the junction on the bottom photograph as a crop mark. Um, and the approach here, even though we, need, we knew that that site had to be um, fully assessed, um, there was a, a number of trenches were done, which is essentially post-determined evaluation to help refine down what mitigation needed to be done. Um, for the main works of the scheme, which took place in 2003, um, there were some large areas of excavation, but others again were more limited to this sort of post-determination evaluation, and they were only 4 by 30 metres in size, size expanding if, if needed. Um, Oh, sorry, I've just lost my place. Uh, the key site that we found that was unexpected was the chariot burial. Apologies for the quality of the photograph. It was taken <laughs> back in 2003. Um, so you can see there we had the, an upright cart burial uh, with, with human remains. And we had to dig this. It was impacted by the scheme. It was found very late in the day. It was underneath a motorway gantry. Um, so, we, so we had to dig it. This is exactly the sort of site that should have probably been preserved in situ under the, the guise of PPG 16. So the key issues on this scheme were insufficient evaluation in that PPG 16 world. So moving a bit further north on the same scheme uh, is the A1 Darrington to Dishworth. Uh, work on that scheme started in 2004 and finally finished last year, so it's been a bit of a career-defining project for me. Um, the scheme um, runs on the route of Deer Street, which is a Roman road, and crosses through three Roman scheduled monuments. Um, we split it into two phases, which was primarily budget-driven. Um, so we did um, Dishworth to Leeming first, and then Leeming to Barton later on. Um, again, we were still in the PPG 16 world at the beginning, but Planning Policy 5 did come, come in later. Um, and that began to have that idea that if there was insufficient information from desk-based research, that you would need to do more evaluation. So on that scheme, um, we undertook more evaluation than we had on the, on the previous one. Um, again, there'd been an earlier iteration of the scheme in the mid-1990s, which had some geophysics, it had some trenching. 
Uh, so what we did is we filled in the gaps, so the areas that hadn't had any geophysical survey, we did. So we had pretty much total coverage of the whole um, scheme. Uh, and that was supplemented by evaluation, but that was really quite limited in nature. Um, it was, you know, to clarify some of the, the information that we had, and it wasn't at all what I'd call an extensive um, coverage uh, across the scheme at all. So the mitigation strategy on that scheme was strip map and sample across the whole of the scheme. Um, and we focused that on the whole road in the first instance, because then that allowed us to focus in on the areas. This approach worked really well on the southern section of the scheme. So when we stripped the topsoil, we basically found what we were expecting to find from the geophysical survey. Unfortunately, when we came to the northern section, that uh, didn't work. So I'm just going to talk you through a few of the, the sites and the issues that we had there. So on the left is the site at Scotch Corner. Um, we'd undertaken geophysical survey. You can see from the results there that there was very little shown, um, but we didn't have any time to do geophysical survey. The northern section of the scheme had a supplemental public inquiry, and basically as soon as they got consent, construction work started. There was no time to stop and reflect to see if we needed to do any other work. Um, and, and you know, trenching this site might have given us an idea about the extensive archaeology that actually was, was found. Uh, this was an early Roman contact period site, probably related um, to Stanic, uh, the capital of the Brigantes just to the north, and it was to do with, with that, that real early Roman contact period. And we had some amazing finds come out of that as well. Uh, the other site on the screen is at Bernessi. Bernessi is a scheduled Roman roadside settlement. And this part of the site um, is just to the north of that, although still within the scheduled area. And from the geophysical survey, we were maybe expecting to find field systems associated with that settlement because we were outside of the core. Um, and we had done a couple of trenches in this area, and I think there was one isolated burial. But that didn't tell us that there was this massive Roman cemetery there with, I think, 220 burials from, from memory. So obviously all of that, needed needed dealing with. <coughs> so the next site is at Cataractonium. Now obviously we knew about this site. It's a scheduled Roman town. It's long been known about. But what, what wasn't so clear was the depth the extent of the depth and survival of the features. Um, so on the left hand side is um, the northern suburb north of the River Swale at, at Cataractonium where trenching had been done. There's obviously been a lot of earlier phases of, of work, both in the 1950s when the A1 was built and subsequently. Um, but nobody was expecting nearly one and a half metres of uh, stratified archaeology. The evaluation hadn't indicated that at all. Um, and then the other site on the, the right was at Fort Bridge. In the 1950s when the A1 was built, which was built in cutting, which you can just see in the background, um, a new bridge needed to be built to take a local road over that. Our project engineers absolutely assured us there is no way in 1950 that they would have left the archaeology in, they'd have just taken it all out, when actually in 1959 they built the road directly on top of the Roman town. Uh, so we had quite a lot of survival there that, that wasn't anticipated. So our um, mitigation approach needed to change and it needed to be reactive to what, to what was found there. Um, so at Fort Bridge, because that one was found uh, at a critical point in the programme when the bridge needed to be built, we had to excavate a strip of the archaeology to allow a working corridor, um, and then the rest of the archaeology could be done. Um, but in the northern suburb, it was, a, it was a more challenging. So we already had over a 12-month period, more than 12 months, to, to, to excavate here. But because the archaeology was so extensive, we couldn't dig everything, so we had to look at a different approach. And we worked closely with Historic England, with the county archaeologist, and with the, the design and construction engineers. So um, our geotechnical colleagues did research into pressure modelling um, to allow us to retain some of the archaeology under the road embankment, You know, looking at both construction and operational loads, and looking at breakage stress of relevant artefact types. And working with Historic England, uh, with the archaeological team on site, you know, we devised um, research questions to, to actually help us focus what we wanted to learn from this site and where we were going to learn it best. And this area in the middle was the bit that we decided we could actually retain. 
Um, that we did do some um, sample areas into it um, to, to give us an idea. And because there was a, a potato tunnel from the previous smash factory, we were able to get a really good um, section all the way through that. So we were able to re record that as well. Um, the other thing we did to enhance significance was a load of outreach. Um, we had quite an extensive, I've spoken about this at, at the conference in 2019. Uh, so we had open days like the one on site. We had temporary museum exhibitions. We had a programme of talks. Uh, what else did we do? Um, we had fines handling, you know, all sorts of things to just, you know, let people who use the road and let people who... Um, lived in the local area, understand the heritage, understand the archaeology, because, you know, it, it belongs to them as much as to us. Uh, so again, on this project, one of the key issues was that it was what was called shovel-ready at the time, as in the road was ready to go, ready to be built straight away, but that didn't take account of the archaeology. Um, and also, again, that lack of evaluation. So coming forward in time, uh, we've got the A428 Black Cat to Caxton Gibbet. This is about 10 miles of new dual carriageway near St Neots in Bedfordshire and Cambridgeshire. Um, it's just worth pointing out on the programme, the examination only closed in February. We've just finished that, so we don't actually have approval for this scheme yet. Um, we knew there were a number of Iron Age and Romano British enclosures across the scheme, and there was a lot of metal detecting and field walking fines. Um, very firmly within MPPF now, so we knew that, um, again, we needed to look at uh, evaluation. Um, but we now also, when we came to start this, in a world where we've got the HS2 Historic Environment Research Designs, where people are beginning to research focus, look at what, um, you know, what we wanted to learn from things. And we also needed to be mindful of lessons learned from the nearby A14 scheme where an awful lot of archaeology was found during construction, which obviously impacted programme and budget, um, and, and National Highways did not want a repeat of that. So as a result, we have much more extensively evaluated. Um, so we did uh, about 600 hectares of geophysical survey. Every piece of ground that was suitable for survey was surveyed. Uh, and we also commissioned a review of aerial photography and LIDAR, uh, where the National Mapping Programme didn't already cover it. And that gave us a much clearer idea on, on the archaeology on the scheme. We had really good results, as you can see, and the, the aerial photography evidence basically matched up. But that wasn't enough. You know, we know from experience that geophysics doesn't always show things. So what we then did uh, was an extensive evaluation, which targeted not only those known sites, but also the blank areas in between, because you know, we needed to test those. Um, so we did 1,339 evaluation trenches in three phases during the pandemic, which was lots of fun. Um, and for those who are interested in percentages, it was just under 3.5% of the scheme that was done. Um, and what this demonstrated that actually the geophysics was accurate, I think we found only a couple of features across the entire scheme that weren't on the geophysical survey. So because we had that confidence, we were able to develop a mitigation strategy that's very targeted um, so that we've looked at the areas of where we know where the sites are, those are the ones that we're going to dig, those are the ones that we're going to focus on. We're not doing any wholesale strip map and record, we're not proposing any watching brief, and yes, that might mean we miss some features, um, but there are mechanisms in place if we do find anything really, really major. <coughs> Um, one of the focuses we had from this was research questions. It's adding value. It's, you know, we had to look at what did we want to focus the resources on? What questions did we want to learn? So every site is accompanied by site-specific research questions. And then in tandem, again, the outreach strategy. It's, it's about you know, letting people know and enhancing significance in that way. And one of the key things that's being done on this scheme is audience mapping so that um, we're looking at not only who the audiences are, not who we think they are, but then asking them what they want, not us dictating what we think they want, just to try and sort of en enhance that. So what, what can we learn from not only these schemes, but all the other major infrastructure projects that have taken place over the last uh, 20 years? Um, there's some key issues that, that come out time and again, and one of those is obviously lack of evaluation. Um, 
there is a real reluctance in a lot of developers from doing this early because they don't want to spend the money before they've got their consent. To them, it's a risk when actually it's the opposite way round. Um, when you're time and again, we get asked, can't we do that evaluation after we've got consent? Well, I think the answer should be no, because we don't, we don't have the answers to fully assess your scheme otherwise. Construction budgets need to be borne in mind, because um, obviously archaeology is only one element of the cost. Um, and, and having cost certainty is also something that's really important. Um, but construction teams add on quite a significant amount of money. Um, and then programmes always a factor, uh, particularly during the construction phase. I think we've probably all been asked, why are you still in that area? When can we get on? When are you getting out? Uh, so that's, again, by, by knowing what the archaeology is and having these defined mitigation, you can plan that better. So what are the possible solutions? Well, evaluate, evaluate, evaluate. Um, this is something I, I really think we do need to be doing more of and doing it early, because the more information you have early on, the less risk there is later, the less risk of those unexpected, expensive, big sites during construction that, that take all the time and, and cost a lot of money as well. Um, and we need to have even more of a research focus. Um, you know, what do we need to learn about the archaeology, but what will we learn from a site? You know, we can't answer every research question from every archaeological site. I can remember back, and I think it was about 2005 at one of the conferences, um, somebody saying, you know, perhaps we shouldn't be digging everything. If we know uh, about an Iron Age roundhouse, its date, form and function, what are we adding by digging it? And that was very controversial back then, but actually I've come round to, to that way of thinking. And then again, it's about outreach. You know, archaeology uh, isn't just for archaeologists. We need to educate developers, particularly uh, being mindful of that evaluation. But we also need to talk to consultees. Is this approach acceptable or palatable? But we also need to take advantage of their local knowledge because there may be some site types that, that just will never show on geophysics or even trenching. And then we need to review um, things like HS2. Have they been successful? So going forward, what would I like to see? Well, I'd like to look at um, substantial evaluation before submission. Um, I think we need, and this, this echoes what people were saying earlier, we need a targeted site-specific mitigation strategies that are tailored to the archaeology of the scheme because there isn't one size that fits all. Um, and again, it's looking at those research questions and it's you know, not just digging it because it will be impacted. If we're not going to learn anything more, why, why are we digging it? And then looking at research questions, not just from the agenda, but things that have come out from that earlier phase of work. You know, are there specific things we had on the A428, questions that came out of the trenching so we could focus down for our, our evaluation? And then again, more outreach. I'm always a, a big advocate for that because I'm running out of time. Um, I just want to say in conclusion, I've told you about the changing landscape of major developments, identifying the lessons that we've learned, and I've put forward some possible solutions for the future for mitigation schemes uh, that maximise knowledge gain and offer best value for both clients and the public. Thank you.